Next speaker, next panelist is Amy Oliver Cook. Uh, Amy is the director of the Energy Policy Center and the Colorado Transparency Project and is the founder of Mothers Against Debt. Under her direction, the Energy Policy Center advances a free market approach to Colorado's energy issues. At the Colorado Transparency Project, Amy investigates government spending at all levels and explains its impact on family budgets. Her work in MAD has gained national attention on Fox and Friends and continues to dominate search engines and YouTube. Furthermore, Amy has written numerous opinion editorials, issue papers, and issue backgrounders on transparency, energy, and fiscal policy. As most Coloradans know, she's a real presence here in the think tank world and in the world of ideas. She also has a great radio show. She's a radio host in northern Colorado. So please welcome um, Amy Oliver Cook. Thank you. Ladies, um, you're going to appreciate this. I wore the wrong outfit. I have no place to put my accessories. So I'm having to carry them. Um, that, the problems of, of being a female speaker. Anyway, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Um, I am a talk show host, which means I'm lousy at giving speeches. I'm much better at simply talking with people. And one of the things I want to share with you real quickly, you heard from my boss at the Independence Institute, John Caldera. And the beauty of being at the Independence Institute is we are completely agnostic on energy resource. We don't care where it comes from, so long as it's affordable, reliable and abundant. Whether we like it or not, we have an economy that is powered by fossil fuel. Now, if you want to change that, fine, but you can't do it. You can't put the cart in front of the horse. Right now, renewable energy is not yet ready for prime time. And if you saw what happened with the bound solar, listen, it wasn't cheap Chinese solar panels that did in a bound solar. A bound solar, the solar manufacturing company in northern Colorado that went belly up after they had spent 70 million of your dollars. I'm sure they appreciate the fact that we all donated to them. I'm sure Pat Stryker appreciates the fact that we funded her little project, her little pet project. But it was no good at any price. There was not a price cheap enough for a bound solar, for those solar panels because they simply didn't work. They didn't work. Do you know what one, one of the employees from Abound Solar said? He said this, our solar panels were great, so long as you didn't put them in the sun. <laughs> now that's a problem when your energy source, <laughs> it's like saying our gasoline's great so long as you don't actually put it in a vehicle. Anyway, so we're agnostic. We just want it to be affordable, reliable, and abundant. And I don't know if you all have ever read Robert Bryce. Robert Bryce is, is an absolute hero of mine. He's at the Manhattan Institute, and he's written a book that my friend over here has read, I know. Um, but it's called Power Hungry. And he has a take on energy policy. And I'm just going to channel it. I'm going to say that this is Robert Bryce's take on energy policy, and I agree with him, only this is from a female's perspective. Here's what I want with energy policy. I want my wine cold, I want my curlers hot, <laughs> and I want my house comfortable. I don't think that's asking too much. <laughs> and by the way, when my child was sick as a newborn, I wanted to be able to plug in the nebulizer and give him the treatments that he needed so he didn't have to be hospitalized. If you've ever been without power, you know what it is. It's power poverty. There are places in the world where that is a real, very real thing. Just recently up in northern Colorado, we had a power outage. Lasted two hours. The station that I, that I work for, that I, where I have my show, the Amy Oliver Show, and it's KFKA 1310, we ran on backup. We had a battery that lasted just long enough so that we could get the generator, that gasoline-powered generator, 
to keep us on the air. Folks, we have a carbon-based economy. And unless you want no economy, you better stick with carbon until the next technology is ready. You can't put, as I say, you can't put the cart in front, in front of the horse, and that's what mandates do. You ought to be in charge, not lawmakers, not lobbyists, not special interest groups. And I say this in particular to ladies. 82% of the renewable energy of the advertising is directed at the ladies. That you know why? Because you're the decision makers in the house. So ladies, join me, and I want to share with you in closing. I actually wear this in public. I'm going to show it. I like hydraulic fracturing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Uh, she does great work. Um, our, our next panelist uh, today is Rob Gordon. He's the Senior Advisor for Strategic Outreach at the Heritage Foundation back in Washington. Working for the House Committee on Resources, he helped cr craft Endangered Species Act reforms that passed the House with bipartisan support and conducted oversight on issues such as international environmental programs and hunting and fishing excise taxes. Prior to serving on the Hill, Rob founded the National Wilderness Institute, a nonprofit conservation organization that promoted conservative environmental policies. His work has been covered by outlets such as Fox and PBS, as well as the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. Rob served two terms as a member of Virginia's Board of Conservation and Recreation and served as a principal in the Grassroots Endangered Species Coalition and the Environmental Issues Council, a great uh, fighter for property rights and a great voice of sanity on environmental issues. Please welcome Rob Gordon from Heritage. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Sean, and uh, I'd like to thank CPAC for uh, including me uh, and giving me a chance to talk with you about energy and environment. Uh, with regard to the environment and energy, uh, we're deluged with bad news. Uh, we're told that humans are degrading natural resources, disrupting delicate ecological balances, the web of life, Earth's natural resources are fragile and finite and destined to degradation and decline. And even supposedly renewable natural resources are threatened given the rate at which they're being depleted. This destruction is unsustainable. We're approaching points of no return, a tipping point for the acceleration of global warming, the line where the extinction rate creates runaway ecological catastrophe. Human consumption drives the degradation and destruction and as population grows, so does the impact. The technological t advances magnify the destruction. Profits from meeting increasing consumption-driven demand enable further technological advances, creating a vicious cycle. The threats humans present demand action, even if some are speculative and the cost of the proposed actions are enormous. Science can no longer be value neutral when employed in the policy arena and should determine environmental policies. Government regulation and ownership, centralized and top-down, is necessary to protect Earth's natural resources. Making society environmental, environmentally sustainable will require social transformation for undeveloped nations with explosive birth rates and especially for developed nations with disproportionate per capita consumption. Achieving this will require altering, eroding, or jettisoning obsolescent cultural concepts, legacies, and institutions. The institution of property rights, the Judeo-Christian concept of dominion, American notions of social and geographic mobility, and clearly consumption-oriented behavior. Policies must establish new norms that put us in greater harmony with the Earth. Opposition to these policies will eventually wane, and ascending generations will have altered expectations tempered by their greater environmental awareness. A little depressing. I've asked other audiences, what do these ideas have in common? And the answer I'm looking for is simple. They are all wrong. In the title of the panel is the infamous Solyndra. 
It however, it, however, is not the disease. It is the symptom. It, like most of our environmental policies, is based upon wrong, a wrong-headed worldview, the one I just described. Bad ideas like these have consequences, bad ones. We have failed to challenge the, these ideas at their root. We have not articulated our own vision, one that can, we can argue with force because it is consistent with the other ideas we cherish, individual liberty, limited government, free markets. Articulating such a vision is what Heritage, along with many of our allies, is doing now. We are promoting a set of principles called the American Conservation Ethic. They are in this publication, and it's available at Heritage's exhibit booth. The publication not only has principles, but also policy papers from 15 authors, including Ed Meese, Don Hodel, and Ken Cuccinelli, and allied groups like CEI, Pacific Legal Foundation, and the Texas Public Policy Foundation. I cannot do them all justice in the time here, but let me say they are profoundly at odds with my opening. The number one principle being that people are the most important, precious, and unique resource. This is a recognition that human creativity is the most powerful force for improving our environment. More importantly, it is a value statement that means an environmental policy cannot be good for the environment if it is bad for people. Others include recognizing that renewable natural resources are resilient, dynamic, and we can use and wisely manage them. Resources should be managed on a site and situation specific basis as we accumulate knowledge, technology, science, we learn how to get more from less, not the other way around. That extensions of private property rights and tapping the market provide the most promising new opportunities. And the most successful environmental policies emanate from liberty. Principles like these will allow us to engage in environmental debates on grounds of our own choosing. It is time for us to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, our final panelist today is Myron Ebel. He's the president of the Freedom Action, director of the Center for Energy Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He previously worked at Frontiers of Freedom, founded by the late Senator Malcolm Wallop of Wyoming. He worked for Representative John Shattuck of Arizona and for the American Lands Rights Association. A native of Baker County, Oregon, where he grew up on a cattle ranch, Mr. Ebel earned degrees at Colorado College in Colorado Springs and at the London School of Economics and did graduate work at the University of California, San Diego and at Peter House, Cambridge University. He insisted that I read the last part of this introduction. <laughs> the Business Insider named him third on their list of the 10 most respected global warming skeptics and commented, <laughs> Myron Ebel may be enemy number one to the current climate change community. Okay. See? And Rolling Stone, no less, named him one of the six top misleaders on global warming, right alongside Senator James Inhofe and the late novelist Michael Crichton. So, so let's bring on the great misleader himself, Myron Ebel. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good morning. Thank you, Sean. I, I'm, I want to thank ACU and, the, and CPAC for inviting me. It's an honor. It's great to be in Colorado and to be out west. It's great to be with high energy conservatives. And Sean uh, didn't mention that uh, long before I joined CEI, he was our Warren Brooks journalism fellow. Rob Gordon and I have worked for years on and off to try to reform or replace the Endangered Species Act. I just met Amy Oliver Cook, but she has worked with my colleague, William Yateman, who's in the audience somewhere on uh, uh, the fuel switching legislation in Colorado. So it's great to be here. Uh, previous speakers have already talked about some of the things I'm gonna talk about, including Mitt Romney, uh, and Marco Rubio, and Doug Lamborn, and Steve Pierce. To get the economy going again, yeah, we know we've gotta get federal spending under control. We've gotta do entitlement reform. But one of the things that we've gotta do and it's up to us in this room to do it, is to stop the war on affordable energy. Yeah. 
this is not being done, this is this war on affordable energy is not being done and prosecuted through inadvertence. It is intentional. When cap and trade was defeated, and it took a long time to defeat cap and trade, when it was defeated, President Obama said, there are other ways to skin that cat. What are they? There are essentially three tiers. EPA regs, which constitute the war on coal, on affordable electricity. We've got one EPA reg after another coming down. You add them all up, and it is disaster for consumers and manufacturers who need affordable electricity. The second tier is access to energy. President Obama goes around the country saying oil and gas production is up during my presidency. Yes, it is up because the land in North Dakota, the gas fields in Pennsylvania, those are on private land. He can't shut them down. Everybody in the West knows that he's shutting down the federal lands to energy production. And it's not just through denying leases and permits. It's all kinds of new guidance on how the federal land should be used for recreation, how climate change implementation uh, and adaptation plans should be put into effect. So we have the shutdown of, if, if he could, re remember Ken Salazar, by the way, Ken Salazar and I were at Colorado College at more or less the same time. Uh, we turned out rather differently. Uh, <laughs> Ken Salazar, when he was a uh, uh, senator, was always called a moderate because he said, no, I'm not against oil and gas development on the federal land. I'm just against that project and that project and that project and that project. That's a moderate in, in today's energy debate. The fact is that President Obama wants to constrict the supply of energy and he wants to raise prices. God knows why. I don't think he understands himself why he wants to do it, but it is wrecking our economy. And in fact, if it were not for the oil and gas production in North Dakota and the, the shale gas in Pennsylvania, this country would be in recession right now. Now the third thing is crony capitalism in Washington, and this panel is called No More Cylindras. The House Republicans passed a bill called the No More Cylindras Act. But I want to tell you that the problem is not just with the Democrats in Washington. We have problems with Republicans because, of course, there are different types of crony capitalists. For example, in Oklahoma, where T. Boone Pickens is a very major player, Senator Jim Inhofe is not a co-sponsor or a sponsor of the T. Boone, what I call the T. Boone Pickens payoff plan to subsidize natural gas trucks and filling stations. But Senator Tom Coburn, who claims to be a fiscal conservative, is. And here in Colorado, Doug Lamborn, congressman from Colorado Springs, and by the way, when I was at Colorado College, it was so long ago that Bill Armstrong was my congressman. <laughs> Doug Lamborn wrote an op-ed recently called Why the Wind Energy Tax Credit Must Go. Now, do you realize how brave this is in a state that has passed a 30% renewable requirement for electric utilities? Because, of course, the, wind, the federal wind tax credit subsidizes your electricity. If you didn't have that credit, you would be paying a lot more for, for those useless windmills. <laughs> Doug Lamborn told me in the speaker's room he said, yeah, I'm really gaining a lot of grief for this. And the big money is against me in Colorado. But two freshmen from Colorado, Scott Tipton and Corey Gardner, and I have a lot of respect for both these men. Scott Tipton and Corey Gardner signed a letter to Speaker Boehner earlier this year from Republican freshmen. Now, these are the Tea Party freshmen, right? These are the guys who are going to clean the house in Washington, saying, oh, yeah, we're against crony capitalism, but we want that win tax credit to be renewed. So here's when Cory Gardner speaks later this afternoon, I hope you all will ask him if you run into him, why is it that you're against no more, you want to get rid of Solyndra? You've argued against crony capitalism, but if, when it's your crony capitalists, you support them. If we're going to change Washington, if we're going to stop the war on affordable energy, if we're going to get America going again, we can't tolerate that from our own people. Thank you.
Thank, thank you, Myron. I knew you'd, you'd throw the crowd a little red meat there. Thanks for that very much. Um, well, let, let me pick up on that a little bit. Um, um, as you point out, it, it, it creates a problem for so-called conservatives when we're inconsistent on the issues. We preach about them on one hand, and then in some cases when it, uh, there's a claim to jobs creation because of it or so, for some other reason, you see this kind of peeling away. So when, when Barack Obama comes to the state of Colorado and we could put up a united front against mandates and, and crony capitalism, we're, we're vulnerable because they can always say they did it too. Um, and it's particularly kind of ironic because, uh, as you point out, Myron, um, you know, we've got a renewable energy mandate already in this state that requires that a certain amount be purchased. The military is spending, there's a lot of stealth subsidies to the clean energy industry that are flowing through the military. That's a roundabout way they're doing it, is buying billions of dollars with a wind and solar. So isn't it time to wean big wind, big sun, and, and let them stand on their own? Um, and, and then maybe talk a little bit about panelists what is the proper mix? Do we know what the proper mix is, or should we allow markets to make those determinations for us? Well, if you have a dead-end technology, Sean, you come to Washington to get it subsidized, <laughs> right? <laughs> and if that doesn't work, you go to the state capitol to get it mandated. And with wind and solar, we got both. And we got an ethanol mandate as well, a huge ethanol mandate. Look, these guys... They, the, the heads of these companies, these wind and solar companies, these ethanol distilleries, they don't have business plans to ever become competitive in a free market. And they spend all of their time in Washington lobbying instead of running their business and trying to make it successful and, and improving their product. Windmills are a dead-end technology partly because we've been subsidizing them for so long. And if you look back, in the 1970s, Wall Street Journal headline, uh, wind and solar will provide, you know, 30% of American power by 2000, you know. I mean, these people have had a dead-end technology for decades, and they keep getting more and more support. If we're going to do anything about it, we have to be consistent. We can't say, my crony capitalist is okay, I just want to get rid of yours. We've got to elect people to Washington, and we've got to keep them honest to say, we got to go cold turkey here, or we'll never get rid of these guys. And they are a huge, huge problem in Washington, D.C. Yeah. You know, I don't have much to disagree with there with Myron. Um, I think the market is going to make the most efficient uh, decisions for us. Uh, yeah. Providing energy is a pretty complex thing. And to expect that some people could sit in a room in Washington and, uh, you know, figure 2 percent of this and 5 percent of that effectively is, is ludicrous. It also um, requires some long-term long thinking. We're so reactive in how we do our energy policy here. It's this, and then gas prices go up. We talk about drilling. There's no consistent application of any of these rules. Like, for instance, now we're making war on coal and swinging radically towards natural gas. And, and, and that, make, that seems to make sense in the short run. But how long will natural gas prices stay low? They won't stay low forever, especially if we shutter every coal-fired power plant. Now they're talking about moving more motorized vehicles to natural gas. It's all moving. The pendulum now swings totally towards natural gas, and, and that's going to have market impacts. That's going to drive up the cost. So what's now seems affordable in the short run, in the long run, it's going to be maybe very expensive and leave us at the mercy or, or actually narrow our energy portfolio. So how can we get a consistent energy vision in this country that isn't just lurch from crisis to crisis, move from problem to problem and, 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 and get the American people on board with a vision like that? Well, I think you really have to uh, let the market do it because Washington has such a twisted view of things. I'm reminded of a, um, an event at the Chamber of Commerce where there was a, a speaker, a friend of mine attended, and they were talking about different energy policies and which ones, uh, different programs, uh, how these different programs were deciding uh, which specific grant should be given and which shouldn't. And at one point, the, speak, the speaker in favor of this uh, program said, well, there, there are really two criteria for this particular program. One is that the technology has to be a viable, a viable on the market. And the other is that it has to be uh, a technology that's been unable to attract investment. <laughs> right. And, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> my, my colleague was there, it's like, this is a Venn diagram with no intersection, you know? But uh, in Washington, people don't understand that. And that's why, you know, it's a really simple answer, but you retreat to the market because it works. 
You know, it, there's just too too much information otherwise. There's the, the uh, you know critics of our side of the argument say, well, fossil fuels are subsidized, and if you look back in the history of oil and gas, they received government support too, and so now it's the renewables turn. How do you counter that argument? I mean, they'll say, okay, you know, fossil fuels get subsidies too, so why shouldn't renewables? But, but Sean, right. If that's true, let's. And I, I don't think it's true to a to very big extent, but if it's true, we shouldn't keep repeating our mistakes. We should learn <laughs> exactly. from our past mistakes. You know, and look, these guys, one thing I want to point out, since I, I've already attacked one conservative, Cory Gardner, <laughs> let, me attack, let me attack the natural gas industry. I'm, all for, I'm for any kind of fuel that can make it on the market. I don't care where I get my electricity or my motor fuel or anything. I just want to know that when, the, when I flip the switch, it works, right? The lights go on, the car starts. I don't care. I don't have any investments. I don't earn enough money to have any investments. <laughs> the natural gas industry, instead of promoting their own industry, instead of spending money in the political and, and policy sphere promoting free enterprise and, and what industry can do, they spent tens, not, not only tens, they spent well over $100 million attacking the coal industry. We can't get the economy going again if one industry's idea of growth is killing another industry. So, so the people in the gas industry have a lot to answer for politically in my mind, and, and they should be held to account too. I said we should hold people, good conservatives like Cory Gardner and Scott Tipton to account. I think we should hold the people in the natural gas industry to account. To the coal industry's credit, they have not gone after gas. Of course, they, their resources are, they produce so much energy for such a low price that they don't have a lot of money to, to spend on that. But, uh, so, you know, if maybe if the price of coal goes up, they would, they would attack gas as well. But I think we need to get the, the people who believe in free markets, free people, free enterprise in this country. Isn't that your, your uh, mission statement or something? We need to get them all working and rowing in the same direction in this country, and that's what people in this room can do. That's what the conservative movement can do. That's what the energy here ought to be devoted to, is to getting everybody rowing in the same direction. No. Sean, can I yeah, just, yeah, sure. I, I want to share a couple of statistics that, and this is actually based on um, information from the Energy Information Administration. Listen to this. Talk about subsidies. And, and, and listen, I'm with Myron. It should be all that makes sense. And there's a reason why we haven't had wind and solar. And, and we can get into why they simply don't work. But think about this. Wind and solar might make up 3% of our total portfolio in the country. Colorado, sadly, we have to suffer a whole lot more. But in fiscal year 2010, these are the subsidies for solar power. $775 per megawatt hour. Wind, $56.29. Nuclear, $314. Hydroelectric, $82. Coal, $64. Natural gas, petroleum, $0.64. Cents. These are cents. Now, we are subsidizing wind and solar. And they, I mean, it's like 66 times and some get more than the fossil fuels. I don't want any subsidies. I think they should all compete. But, yeah, I mean, really. And, but we subsidize wind and solar. Why? Because we politicized a basic need. We have to have power. Our economy is a, it's a power-based and power-driven economy. We have to have it. But I'll tell you what, if that production tax credit for wind, if it doesn't go through, and I hope, I hope they don't extend it, Listen, I, we, we, Michael Sandoval and I wrote an op-ed opposing that right after that letter came out. Oh, you know, we all want, we want to extend the production tax credit for wind. Forget it. And you know why? Because Coloradans need to pay for the decision we make. There is no reason in the world why somebody in Idaho should pay for our green fuel fantasies. Right. And right. I'll, I'll tell you what, since then... Since 2004, when we passed the renewable energy mandate, and then subsequently it went from 10 to 20 to 30, how many of you here are on an investor-owned utility named Excel? They said your prices were going to go up. I mean, 2% was the cap. I got to tell you, mine's going up a whole lot more than that. It is high, and it's going to go up more if that production tax credit doesn't get extended, and it should. 
It absolutely should, because Idaho has a whole lot lower electric rate rates than we do, so does Wyoming, and it is high time Colorado paid for its own mistakes. See, I, I, think, I think a lot of times uh, Republicans get sucked into the, and there's always this creep in programs, right? It, it's originally created to cut house, greenhouse gases and make things, but then it becomes a jobs program. Every federal program becomes a jobs program sooner or later, and that's the case here. And there's a claim out there that the wind tax credit accounts for 5,000 jobs in, that, in this state. It is ridiculous. You know, and the media suspends all skepticism on these claims, as it does most in the green. In fact, I call called the Denver Post. I, keep, I kept seeing this 5,000 jobs claim in, in the Denver Post. So I actually called him up, called the reporter, and said, where are you getting that number? He said, well, I got it from a colleague, and then he, he tracked it back to the colleague, and then he said, well, it comes from the wind energy industry. I said, well, well, wouldn't you take with skepticism if you saw some statistic that came from the energy industry? They'd be all over it. They'd be fact-checking it and, and looking under every rug. But in this case, they give him a total pass. Then the guy comes back to me, and at least he returned my calls, which is a major breakthrough with some journalists. And he said, you know what? You're right. Um, that's an inflated number. He said, I know of probably 3,000 jobs. And I didn't want to be rude because he did call me back. But I said, how do you know about those 3,000 jobs? Have you called the actual facilities that these jobs are supposed to, to be held at? Those are inflated numbers. Those are bogus numbers. But again, the green-leaning media gives them a complete pass on these issues. The other thing that I deeply resent as a Colorado and watching this whole thing unfold is average workers in Colorado are being held hostage. They're, not, they're caught in the middle. They hire on to go to the Vestas manufacturing plant or something like that. They go to work for a subsidy dependent industry. Then when the subsidies are going away, all these companies, a Dutch company, by the way, Vestas, which I think means shakedown in Dutch, or, um, <laughs> you know, then they, then they hold our workers hostage, and they say, we're cutting these jobs, and that's what they're doing right now. You know, Pueblo, Colorado put out $23 million in incentives, cash on the barrel head incentives for Vestas to come there. And now they're cutting all the jobs because we won't renew the tax credit. So, you know, who's, who's cold-hearted here? Are Republicans who don't want to extend these wasteful credits cold-hearted? Or is it an industry that's dependent on subsidies, can't stand on its own, and is holding its own workers hostage to the continuation of these subsidies? Who's wrong-headed in this situation? You know, Sean, you talk about um, how, how, to, how to educate people. I, I was part of a, an event in, in Nevada, in, in uh, Reno, uh, Las Vegas. I think they did in Michigan, even here in... in uh, Colorado. It's called the Gas Can event and the Gas Man event. And we did it with our, our great partners, Americans for Prosperity and American Commitment. And what we did is we actually took gas and we offered it at the same price as of January 2009 when the president got inaugurated. It was $1.84. And we, and we bought gas for these folks and we start talking about the stories. How does this affect you? Like one lady came up and she goes, this has saved me 30 bucks, just this one fill up. I said, how many times do you fill up a month? She goes, like, six, seven times. So this, would, this saves me about, uh, if the gas is $1.84 again, that would save me like 400 bucks a month. I go, what would you do with 400 bucks a month in your pocket? And this is what we got to start talking about, how is it affecting people? She goes, I could get off welfare. And, and we talk about how, how uh, this president's fighting for the middle class every single day. He's not. I mean, because this, this, she said, I would love to get off welfare. I don't want to be on welfare. I don't want my kids seeing me go to these offices and see me have to get this check. Because I'd rather be out there with my kids. I can now. I can at least with this thirty bucks. I can take my kids out to McDonald's. I can do family stuff. I, we we talked to another single mother. She goes, I, you, "You don't know what you're doing for me." She said, "This is such a great thing. I, I can I can spend some time. I can take my kids to the zoo today." This is affecting families, and I don't think we talk about that enough. How it's affecting the everyday people. What this what this uh, this what, the gas is almost double, more than double. And that's, if you want to get people off welfare, you want to, you want to take the welfare from 30, 47 million back down to 32 million, let's, 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 let's fix the energy prices. Let's put a tack in it. Let's, let's, let's focus on things that's working. That's working for people every single day. And that's important for us to realize and remember. It's real, yeah, it's really true because, you know, here would they tout the green energy jobs even while people, coal miners in Trinidad, Colorado right now are out of work. The war on coal is having impacts all over the West, not just here in Colorado. And the spotted owl decimated the timber industry in the Pacific Northwest. Those towns today, all those former loggers who made good money are living on welfare. So, and this is where the media, again, I hate to be a media basher since I'm a recovering one myself, but the fact of the matter is media don't want to tell 
tell the human stories. It's always the simple morality play of the good crusading environmentalists versus the bad, horrible industries that want to rape the planet. And in between are thousands of towns all across the West, all across America, and millions of people who are losing jobs or could lose jobs, but for some reason they're the forgotten people. We talk about the clean energy jobs, but we don't give a damn about the coal miners in Trinidad who right now today are out of work because of Obama's war on coal. So the media needs to you know, get with it a little bit and, and, and get past this sort of simplistic, silly morality play that they paint and actually look at what the Green Edge agenda is about, understand that this is a huge, well-funded lobby, as big and as powerful as the industries that they port, purport to, to counter, and, and come to their senses and deal with these issues and, and bring a little balance to how these issues are reported. Go ahead. Uh, Jump in. I, I think you're getting to the, to the base of it, which um, from my perspective, uh, when you're talking about energy, energy is the capacity to do work. That's what it is. And this is not a debate over uh, which kind of energy we will have. It's really a debate about whether we'll have affordable, reliable energy. Because what is being proposed, the physics just aren't there. And um, that's not an accident. I mean, there's some people that perhaps are misguided, but there are others who know. I mean, the president himself said, you know, hey, you can build a coal-fired power plant, but I'm going to bankrupt you. Right. Now, why? And uh, I, I would argue that it's not just about CO2 emissions. It's not just out of concerns about global warming. What it really is about is this belief that man is kind of a blight and we've had too much economic growth. And you can't convince the public, and let's say that the economy was a car moving down the, down the road, you couldn't convince them that we're get, we should slam on the brakes because people know we need to have economic growth and prosperity and all the good things that come with it. Um, so instead, you might do it in a very nefarious way. You might say, hey, we're gonna have these alternative energy sources. They're nice. They're, they're sustainable. Well, really, I think sustainable in this context, while everybody agrees with we want things to be sustainable with the plain meaning of the word, but what they're not telling you is it's really code. It's code for less. It's code for stagnation. stagnation and we really need word. to start pointing out what the true agenda is behind this, in addition to the people that are trying to milk Washington for its riches. But there's a more nefarious thing going on, and it's this imposition of these kind of very strange, uh, wrong worldviews on our society. Absolutely. The reason the global warming agenda has been adopted by the left is, is, what, is because of what Mitt Romney has started calling trickle-down government. If you can control the energy sector, you can control what people do with their lives. And this is the whole goal. The, President Obama, in his entire career, never showed any interest in, in the environment, global warming, energy, nothing. But when he got into the White House, he was looking at levers to make government bigger, more intrusive, and to take control of the economy. That's why he is continuing to pursue the global warming agenda. And I want to just tell you, it's not just energy. It's also these cafe standards on automobiles. We've, uh, Congress, with President George W. Bush's support, foolishly supported raising the standard to 35.5 miles per gallon. I don't know if you have these here in Colorado, but in Washington, D.C., we have these little things called smart cars. Uh, have you seen a smart car? It's about as big as Rob and me together. <laughs> uh, a smart car gets 35 miles to the gallon. And, and, but President Obama said that's not enough. He has raised CAFE standards to 54 miles per gallon by 20 20, is that right. Right? right? Now, look, 54 miles per gallon. The automakers will still make big rigs. They will still make Ford F-150s and Chevy Silverados. But the only people who will be able to afford them are people who don't need them. Stockbrokers, bankers, medical doctors, lawyers. <laughs> Anybody who has a ranch or a farm or a logging business or is a tradesman or a builder, they won't be able to afford a big rig. And if you look at the Obama administration, Carol Browner, EPA administrator for eight years under Bill Clinton, two years climate czar for, in the White House for President Obama, she recently reassured the environmental movement on a campaign conference call. She said, okay, we haven't been quite as pure as you want, but don't worry, wait till you see our second term. Right. 
This isn't done. They haven't begun to get done. And they have, uh, look at the ozone rule. I mentioned all these EPA rules. One of the EPA rules, President Obama delayed until after the election. A year ago, he delayed it. Why? Because the EPA estimates it will cost $90 billion a year. The Manufacturers Policy Institute did a much more exhaustive study. They said $1 trillion per year. Per year, every year. We have a $15 trillion economy. We're going to have a rule that is $1 trillion a year. Obama didn't kill it. He just delayed it until after he gets reelected. That's why you all have to get going here. Wait, I don't have to say <laughs> I want to add, listen. If they don't get it done at the federal level, where they're also headed are the states. And Colorado has been ground zero for some of the most disastrous energy policy. We ought to be apologizing to everybody else because they want to take our policies and make them federal. But we have a 30% renewable mandate by 2020. Uh, the environmentalists already are circulating a petition. They want that to go much higher. It isn't high enough. That's coming in the next legislative session. We need to be marching on the Public Utilities Commission, marching on the Capitol, and wearing T-shirts. And ladies, it's you. I'm, I, I say that in all seriousness. When we show up with our pitchforks angry, we can start changing. And just to add to that, when you think about the power of environmentalists, you, you had, they are more powerful than the unions now. Look at the pipeline. That would have created 20,000 union jobs. They trumped it. Yeah. And they just ignored it. And look how powerful that is. I mean, they have more power than the unions now. And look what's happening to the unions in Pueblo. They're killing them down there as well. So it is, it is getting more powerful. Look at the 20,000 jobs that could have been created. But look at the collateral jobs that could have been created if that pipeline had been built. The grocery stores that support them. Uh, gas stations that are there, manufacturers that are building things for them, clothing uh, folks, are, it's a lot of collateral jobs that have been created, but he just doesn't care. He wants to make the environment happy, and that's, that's kind of scary that they've gotten that powerful. Look at the EPA when it got started. I think it was created under Nixon, and, and they created it because there was fires on, on the rivers in Cleveland. But look how much power they got. I don't think he envisioned right now, EPA people can carry guns. That's not what that was supposed to be for. So we always got to be careful when we create. There's no such thing as a pilot program in D.C. <laughs> it's just not true. It never, never goes away. Or a temporary program. Or a yeah. temporary program. <laughs> yeah. You know, we here in the West we gotta have... Go. We got to oh, go. Oh, are we done already? Yeah. Okay. Zero. 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 I thought we had five more minutes. It's 15 after. Don't we have five more minutes? What time is on your watch? I'm just looking at the clock here. It says okay. zero. Uh, we've, got five, we, we've got five more minutes. Well, I think a question near and dear to the heart of Westerners is, you know, the West does have a, the West does have a unique relationship with the environment, with energy production due to the prevalence of federal lands out here. Um, one of the proposals that Mitt Romney has floated, which is, I think, called energy federalism, somebody's called it that, basically ceding more control over the energy decisions in a state to states. What's the workability of that? What are the political obstacles to that? Do you think it can work? As a Westerner, a transplant, a Westerner, albeit, but a Westerner, I, I, I'd be perfectly comfortable. In fact, I'd applaud um, the state of Colorado or Wyoming or Utah. We live with the impacts of these things. We should have much more of a say in how federal land decisions are made on energy and a lot of other things, forest fires being one of them, forest management. So what about a, an energy federalism? Is it feasible politically? Is it workable? How might it look? And, and the, what might the be the benefits? to do it is to get rid of the federal lands. Yeah. Uh, Ken, State Representative Ken Ivory should be here today. He has gotten a bill through the Utah legislature and signed into law last spring that the Utah state of Utah puts the federal government on notice that they have two years to turn over the federal lands to the state of Utah. Now, that's the kind of, he's trying to, he's trying to get other western states to, to to do the same thing, Arizona, New Mexico. It'll be a hard sell in Colorado, but it, that's what we, that, that, look, as long as the federal government controls the economy of the rural west, the economy of the rural west will continue to decline. I come from eastern Oregon where it's about 75% federally owned. I've looked at what the BLM and the Forest Service have done. They closed, they have, they killed the timber industry. They've closed down the roads. Thousands, you know, what, Wallowa Whitman National Forest, the forest supervisor tried to close over 50% of the roads in one one go, but if you look back over the last 30 years, they've already closed down 50% of the roads. So you got 50% of 50%. It's unbelievable what they are doing to kill the rural West. The only way to get, do it is to get rid of these guys and send them back to Washington. Um, 
I, I think there's a tremendous amount. We, we know there's a tremendous amount of energy uh, on the federal estate and, and the OCS, and it's, none of it is contributing uh, right now. I mean, well, not none, but compared to what is available, so little of it uh, is being tapped. Uh, I think people don't even have a decent concept of how big the federal estate is. Uh, if you add all the major agencies together, it's something like 630 million acres, which is more than, say, Germany, Poland, France, Spain, Italy, England, and three or four more countries combined. And the majority of that is not national parks. Something like, you know, 15% is national parks. The biggest single holder there is the Bureau of Land Management. And um, as Washington has become more green, more dominated by the environmental lobby, more and more of that has been uh, taken off limits. And you have states in the West here that have 50, 60, 70% uh, federal ownership. You could totally change the economy uh, by tapping some of those resources. And I, I am in agreement with Myron that the most uh, probable way that that would happen is to devolution a lot of those lands. Well, on that note, we have to wrap it up. We've only just scratched the surface of so many issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you for CPAC. Thank you for my excellent panel today. I really appreciate it.